When Pastor John asked me to give about five minutes on the crucifixion, my first thought was five minutes? There's like all that lead up, and then there's all the stuff. In the, it's like three chapters in some of the Gospels. Um, and so as I was doing my preparations, you know, I thought I could do, you know, uh, go traditional and talk about the stations of the cross, you know, where Jesus went and how he carried the cross and people who did it who helped him carry it, and I thought, no, and then I thought, well, I could do the words from the cross, you know, the different prayers he did, especially, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and then I realized that I think the best thing to talk about is the reason for the cross. See, as, as I was doing my research, I looked, and I found in Luke 19, and because we don't have a lot of time, I don't, I'm not going to go there directly. But in Luke 19, this is after Jesus has been brought to Pilate, and Pilate questions him, and Pilate says, like, there's no reason you're in front of me, Jesus. And he tries to get the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders to give up Jesus, because he's like, there's no reason, I'm not going to execute this guy. He hasn't committed treason against Rome. And finally, after he goes back and forth with them several times, at the very end, after they've already beat him, and Pilate's like, look, we beat him, just, I can set him free. They say, no, you know, he's like, he goes, they say, no, he's claiming to be the son of God. So Pilate goes back and talks to Jesus, and Jesus doesn't deny it. And Pilate comes out and he says, he's your, he says he's your king. And the religious leaders say, we have no other king but Caesar. We have no other king but Caesar. Why do they say this? Well, they have power. They have their own kingdoms. They've been given this power by Caesar. They are in power over the Jews, and they don't want to give it up. And in fact, if you look all throughout the Gospels, Jesus confronts this power that the religious leaders have, but specifically in Matthew 15, there's this interchange where Jesus and his disciples aren't washing their hands, and the Pharisees go, you're supposed to wash your hands. And Jesus says, why should I clean the outside? When the, you know, He says, you guys, you clean the outside, but the inside's still dirty. He says, the things you do make it difficult for people to come to God. In fact, he gets so mean that one of his own disciples says, Jesus, you're offending them. And Jesus says, I know. See, the point was, Jesus came to talk about a different kingdom. He came to talk about a kingdom that seeks the disenfranchised. But that kingdom was in direct opposition to the kingdoms of the religious leaders. Because they had power and they had authority. And that got me thinking, is Jesus' kingdom in conflict with my own? Are there things that I do that are direct conflict with the kingdom that Jesus preached? Do I care for others more than myself? Or do I seek to hold the little power that I have? See, I think, I think that's true. And it reminded me of a song That song is called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And it talks about the love that God had to send Jesus to die on the cross. And it's easy for us to look at the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders saying we have no other king than Caesar, calling for Jesus to be crucified, letting a robber go free who is guilty instead of Jesus who is innocent. And it's easy for us to look at them, to look at the things they did, how they made the Sabbath a burden to people when it was supposed to be a blessing. 
And it's easy for us to say, they were not following the decrees of God. (laughs) The truth is, we don't either. And see, how deep the Father's love for us has three lines that hit me every single time. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. See, the crucifixion and the cross is about that sin. And often we think of that sin as the things we do, the lies and the mistrust and the hatred. And those are all true, but all of those come from the same root. And that's that we want our will and not God's. And yet, even before the cross, as Charlotte said, Jesus said to the Father, not my will, but yours. And so this funeral of the God-man who died on the cross is because our kingdoms are in conflict with his. His death is the direct result of our unwillingness to give up our kingdoms. That is what the crucifixion was about. Let's pray. There was darkness of soul and spirit the hours following the crucifixion. Some disciples scattered and just ran, and others huddled together in an upper room with the doors locked and barred. You could smell the oil lamps and burning while they were gathered close together. There was a mixture of fear and doubt, worry and with a, with a paralyzed mood that everything was out of their control. Everything has run aground like a fishing boat that has rested upon a sandbar. Their hope was gone. There's no fixing this. Things could not be undone. Speaking of the future, what could that be possibly like? How could we begin to think about that? Survival is what our lives are all about right now. Jesus told us of a kingdom. He tried to tell us that uh, all this was going to happen. But we didn't get it. I wonder if we'd ever get it. Everything we thought we knew wasn't what we were experiencing now, right now. How could I feel that God is good when it seems like my whole world is is broken? Yet he said, greater love hath no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friends and You are my friends. Grief is the shadow that hangs over us right now. But the questions. Is the soldiers looking for us too? The rattling of the gate or doors. Will they do to us what they did to him? We pray for relief and heaven is... Like brass, we don't hear the voice of God. We only have a continuing playing of the memories of those last hours. The phony trial, the beatings, the agony, the crown of thorns, that blood. Oh, the blood. How do you even make it to the hill without dying along the way? Darkness. Earthquake, 
tombs opened, veil torn in two, nails and hands and feet. These images never stop. Restore the kingdom? Where? What? Who? We believed it was all about Him. We hear no voice. We receive no light. No burden lifted. Why didn't we do more? We ran. We denied. We huddled. These experiences of the disciples in those hours has been often called the wilderness experience, where every emotion, strength, even the idea of moving forward in life, everything stops. The other expression that is used for a time like that is the dark night of the soul, where there is a spiritual depression and it seems God is silent. When this happens, everything we think we know about God goes away. C.F. Lewis writes of experience of the silence of God when his wife Joy died of cancer. He writes in his journal, no one ever told me that grief felt like fear. I am afraid, but the sensation is like, like being afraid. The fluttering of the, in the stomach and the same restlessness. On a rebound, one passes to, into tears and pathos and maudlin and tears. I almost prefer the moments of agony these are at least clean and honest. Meanwhile, where is God? When you're happy, so happy that have, I have no sense of needing Him. And if you remember yourself and turn to Him and with gratitude and praise, you will be, and so it feels, welcomed in open arms. But go to Him and in your need and desperate, dis, desperate, and when all other help is vain, and you, what do you find? A door slammed in your face, a sound of the bolting, double bolting on the inside, after the silence, you may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. Why is it that he's, his presence so commanding, commander, in a time of prosperity and so very absent a help in times of trouble? Later, Lewis would write these words. I gradually have gradually been coming to feel that the door is no longer shut and bolted. I was like a drowning man who can't be helped because he clutches and he grabs. The silence of God in our lives lead us sometimes down the low road of disillusion and despair, or despair. Disillusion, because every thought that we knew comes in dead out. Despair, because doubt becomes so strong that we say, well, what's the use anyway? There's another option. Waiting patiently. Patience is the only thing a disciple has left when entering the wilderness zone, the dark night of the soul. 
It stops us from clutching and grabbing. It drives us to long for God even more. As a deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all the day long, where is your God? I believe Jesus experienced the silence of God on that cross. That moment when he cried with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalmist would continue with these words. Why are you so far from me, from saving me, from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry day and you do not answer and by night, I find no rest. Even in God's silence, God is closer than you think. It was written on a cellar in Germany during the Holocaust, these words. I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I can't feel it. I believe in God, even when he is silent. It's the darkness between crucifixion and resurrection. And many of us live sometimes in that spot between the two. We're called to more and more draw, being drawn to God and stop the clutching and grabbing and, and just wait on Him. Because that burial in the tomb <laughs> isn't the end isn't the end. Pastor Don asked me to do the resurrection, but I think, yeah, this is more like funeral clothing, don't you guys think? But, oh, look at that. Thank you, Jessica. So this is the resurrection. And we have to have happy colors. It is Easter after all. I mean, you guys are all out there thinking like, what is he wearing today? Okay. I'm not going to button this all the way. It's going to take forever. All right, so it's the resurrection, which is awesome. And we wear happy colors because it's spring, and spring reminds us of new life. It reminds us to rejoice, and there are like 15 babies here, and it makes me so happy. He is alive. The tomb is empty. The cross is empty. We are not at a funeral. We're having a party. See, and the resurrection is so great because Paul, as Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15, that he is the first fruits. Jesus is the first of the family of God that will be raised to glory. Paul says that our bodies were made in dishonor, but they'll be raised in honor. The hope of the resurrection, the joy of the empty tomb, 
is that we don't have to stay in mourning. That the silence will be broken. But I want to talk a little bit about something else. See, we often think about the rejoicing, but we don't realize exactly what Paul is saying. He is saying we will have glorified physical bodies. It's not going to be halos and harps and clouds. And in fact, if we go to Revelation 21, and I'm actually going to turn there because I love it so much. we find a great promise. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. Mm -hmm. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Did you catch that? New heaven and a new earth. And Jerusalem comes down to earth. It goes up to heaven to meet God and comes down to earth. See, that promise of a new earth, that promise of the glorified bodies, means that what we do matters. In fact, this was the kingdom that Jesus talked about, the kingdom that sent him to the cross, and the kingdom for which he raised, was raised from the dead. See, sometimes we think that unless you're a preacher or a missionary, you're not doing the work of God. And this just goes against that. The hope of the resurrection is that what we do for God's kingdom matters. The joy of the resurrection, the hope of Christianity, is that our lives here and now have a purpose. And that purpose is not just to save souls for heaven, because as we just read, heaven and earth will be made new and we will have glorified bodies. Yes, We are to tell people about God. That's a great thing. But why? When you look at the people that Jesus talked to, when you look at the woman at the well, she goes and says, come see this man that told me who I am. See, we share the good news because in the hope, in the gospel, In the kingdom that Jesus preached, we find our identities. And more than that, the hope is that there is a day coming where there is no more tears and no more crying and no more pain. And that that dark night of the soul will cease. And we will dwell with God. He will make his tabernacle among his people. And as Paul said, we see through a mirror darkly, but then we shall see face to face. And that is the point of the incarnation and the crucifixion and the resurrection. God's kingdom. And if we want to know what God's kingdom looks like, all we have to do is look at the Gospels. All we have to do is look at every time Jesus said, this is what the kingdom is like. And if we look, we see that the kingdom is living a life like Jesus. 
we see that we are called. Jesus calls each of us to do the same things that he did. And that kingdom, Paul talks about it all the time, caring for widows and orphans. Why? Because they had no rights. They had no say. And in the kingdom, there are no tears and no crying and no suffering. And if that's the kingdom to come and we are called to help God, not that we can do it ourselves, but if we are called to help God, then the message we should preach should not have tears or crying or suffering. See, that's the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of us. It's the kingdom of God. Caring for widows and orphans. Living in community. Putting others first. See, because when everybody puts others first, then everybody is built up. And you can't force somebody to do that. It doesn't work. We have to lay down our kingdoms and take up the kingdom of God. But the joy of that is, when we take up the kingdom of God, when we live in the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed, we realize that we have finally found our purpose and our identity. And so the resurrection reminds us that we are new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. And we have joy because death has been defeated. Sin no longer has a hold on us. Paul mocks death. He says, where is your sting? And we can walk in the light with our God and our Creator and our Savior. And we can remember that there is no suffering. There is no crying. And the pain that we feel now is passing. There is a day coming that we have hope.